Um, one of our constant themes in developing really any kind of software, but we'll look at it from a web development perspective, is to making sure the code is in one place. Um, we saw that back in CISS 230 or 216, where we took and we put our CSS code in a separate file from our HTML. All right. And what's the advantage of that? The advantage of that then is pages could share that code. So you didn't have to go and recreate that code every time. And more importantly, if something changed, you didn't have to go and change it on every single page. You put it in one place. If you put it in one place, then it only needs to be changed in one place. All right. And we can do that with JavaScript as well. All right. We can put JavaScript in an external file. So if several pages share the same JavaScript, they can uh, all access the same copy. So if you found a bug in it, for example, or if you want to add some functionality, all you'd have to do is change it in the one place. And we also explored that in the examples with the, the dice game and with the truck rental, where we took code that previously lived as part of the button and put it in its own class. And the reason that we did this is because um, that way, if more than one page needed to do that calculation, needed to do that server functionality, that it could happen without um, duplicating effort. So if we had to change it, fix a bug, whatever. Now our calculation was pretty simple, to be sure. But it would work with larger calculations as well. Maybe calculations that involved interacting with the database, for example. All right. What I want to do is I want to bring that up and see if there's any questions about that. And then we'll move on to today's topic, which sort of extends that theme, but in a different direction. take a minute to review that. First of all, I want to make sure we finished. I, I think we finished this example, but I honestly can't remember if we finished it or not. So we'll take a look, see if there's anything that we need to finish. And if there is, then we'll finish it. If not, we'll review it. the folder in which the web config file lives, where my code lives, which is this one, and open it. And I took the calculation and I created a custom class. And I gave it a meaningful name. I gave it truck. And the idea here is we're sort of building a bit of our own framework. Right? We could put anything that deals with a truck in this class. So figuring out the last time or, or the next time it needs an oil change could be some functionality that would appear in this, um, in this um, class. All right? Or has its license plate expired? Or is it under warranty? Or anything like that. Anything that dealt with a truck we would want to have put in this class. That's known as encapsulation. All right? So you don't have little pieces of code living isolated from each other. Everything about a truck lives in this file, all right? lives in this class. 
Now, in our case, all we're interested in is the, the, the amount to rent the truck. So that's all we put in here. And again, as I said before, if you take advanced C sharp, um, you'll learn a lot more about creating objects and classes. And uh, even if you take the Java class that I teach, you'll learn a lot more about classes and uh, you'll be able to do a better job at this. But at the very least, we're getting this code out in its own file. So that's, a, that's good enough for this class. It's a good enough start to this concept. If we look at this, whoops, our code, we have our function that accepts some arguments, the start date, the, the end date, the number of miles, and the size of the truck and returns a double that contains what the fee is for running that truck. This function gets everything it needs when that function gets called. Everything it needs gets passed in as an argument. There's nothing from the outside world that it needs to worry about. It's self-contained. Sometimes it's called a black box, whereas a black box is an old electrical engineering term. It's where you know what the inputs are and you know what the output is. And you really don't care if you're using this what goes on in the middle? So for example, if it was my job to create a page that, that calculated the truck calculation, I don't really need to know what the truck calculation, uh, rental fee uh, truck calculation is. I just need to know the name of the object that I create and what function I call and what I need to pass it. All the work will happen inside this function and it will get returned. All right? Notice this also has nothing to do with a specific user interface. In other words, I'm not giving it text boxes. I'm not looking at text boxes, or I'm not putting the result in a label, or I'm not doing anything like that. I am simply getting the input wherever the input comes from, doing my calculation, and returning the result. So whatever the result, however the result needs to be displayed, Whoever called the function can take care of that and display it where it needs to display it on the screen. Just like wherever the data comes from, all right, um, this function doesn't care about it. So the data could come from a drop down, it could come from a text box, it could come from check boxes, whatever. This function doesn't care about that. In it, I have the function that I had before, with the exception of. It's now looking at the arguments, because that's where this function gets its inputs from, the arguments. When I call the function, these arguments get their values, and I do the calculation. So here's the calculation. The rate is $20, $30, or $40, depending on the size of the truck. I calculate the number of days, and I add one to it, because if they rent it today and return it today, they still get charged for one day. All right. I do the calculation, taking the number of miles times 75 cents, the number of days times the rate, and I return the answer. So now, if, if our company were to change the rules, all right, and maybe instead of hard-coded, they would store the rates in a database, which would probably be a good idea, right? I wouldn't have to change six different programs calculation. I would just simply change this one class to look for the rates in the database, all right? Or if I change the rules to maybe uh, take into account the time that it was rented. Maybe I'll give you, maybe if you return it in four hours or less, I'll only charge you for a half day. All right? Or I'll charge you in increments of a half day instead of a full day. So maybe the time would become important. Well, I don't have to worry about changing anything other than this logic. And anyone that uses this logic can continue to use it, and the new results will reflect a new answer. So how do we use this? Well, in our code behind, the button code becomes very, very simple. The button code, all it does is it takes and creates an instance of that new class. It calls the appropriate function, giving it the values from the form, all right? And it takes the results and displays it on the screen. Ideally, you want your button click events to be small. You don't want them doing the work. 
Because if they're doing the work, then we can't duplicate that easily on other pages. If they are, however, calling a class to do the work, then we can duplicate that functionality on other pages easily. All right, so I guess we did make it through this example all the way. Are there any questions about this? Does anyone remember why the is valid is here? It's here for a very specific purpose. It's because of our validators. That's correct. And normally, if client-side scripting is enabled, this code won't execute. It won't be submitted to the server unless the data is valid. The only reason this code is in here is if client-side scripting is disabled on the browser. Because if it's disabled on the browser, then our validators run on the server side. That's a big advantage of using the ASP.NET validators, is they run both on the client and server side. So they run on the client side and prevent the form from being submitted if the data is invalid. And that's good, right, because the user gets an immediate result. It doesn't have to go all the way to the server and let the server determine that the data is not valid. It's also beneficial from the server side because the server side is not bothered trying to do calculations where the data is not valid. However, if client side is disabled, then we don't want to go ahead and do this calculation if the form data is not valid. So we put this catch in here. Is valid is a reserved word. And what that means is that all the validation tests passed. So if all the validation tests passed, then it's okay for us to do this. So any page where you have a button click event should start out like this, if is valid. I would put that in there even if you don't have any validators, right? That way if you add validators at a later time, then um, you'll, you know, you'll, you'll already be in position um, where you won't have to worry about change, making that change. So all your button click events should look like this, if is valid. If it's not valid, you don't want to go ahead and do the rest of this. All right, any questions about this? Let's talk about something that we have not previously discussed how to keep the code all in one place. We talked about how to keep all the CSS code in one place by creating an external file. You can do the same thing with JavaScript. You can do the same thing with the C Sharp code by creating a custom class. The one kind of code that we have not talked about how to create and put it in one place and reuse that on multiple pages is our actual HTML page. Now if you go to pretty much any site and look at it, most sites have a basic structure that's consistent from page to page. So, for example, if we were to go to Amazon, I guess we could even look at Canvas, but let's look at Amazon. That's more fun. All right. Notice what we have here. And we're going to notice how this, even if we go from page to page, parts of this page stay the same. So we got this banner up here. We have this footer down here. There's a bunch of stuff on it. If we go somewhere else on our site, notice what we got. We have the same HTML up here, right? We have the same footer down there. If I look at a product, let's say I want to buy a Cleveland Browns t-shirt. I don't know why, but I, I like this, by the way. 14 to 20, 29, 25. What does that mean? Like the good teams are going to charge you 29, 25? Like the Browns will charge only 14 for? Or they'll give you one for free? Or you ask nice? Or, or what? Again, notice as we go to this page, again, this is consistent. And that is consistent. If I go to an individual product, all right, 
Let's look at what this looks like. Consistent. A little bit different, right? Because I don't think we had that on our homepage, sport and fitness. Recommended products, product details, and so on. I go to another product. Let's say a totally different product. Not sports and outdoors, but let's look at a Kindle. Say I want to buy this. Notice that this is different. All right? And the rest of it is the same. And of course, the stuff on the bottom is the same. And then there's recommended items and so on and so forth. All right? We can even find this, and we can find this if we look at LC's website. All right? Consistent, consistent. As I navigate around here, if I go to current student, And I go to academic offerings, let's say. Notice this navigation is, is a certain thing. If I go to community services, and I pick one of these things, Notice this is different. Now, all the pages in the community service section have this as a sub-navigation. The main navigation, the header, the main navigation, and the footer stays the same on every page on the site. And then there's sections that are in common for different groups of pages. So all the community services page have that as a sub-navigation. All the current students page have this as a sub-navigation, and so on. So they're sort of like levels, but the bottom line is that there's chunks of HTML code that gets reused. All right? Every single page has that header on it. Every single page has a footer. Then we can even take it deeper and say every page within a section has a certain subnav. Has everything that's on every page, plus it has things in common with everything in its section. And likewise, everything in a different section has things in common with its section, etc. All right, so if we were doing this, if we were just writing plain HTML or even if we were writing ASP.NET code with the stuff that we've learned so far in this class, would have a lot of duplication. And if, for example, they wanted to do something like add a paragraph up here, maybe explaining where Lorraine Community College is located and give a brief summary of the kind of services that we provide, we would have to go and change that on every single page. How many pages do you think are on LC's site? A, a bazillion. Seven. Yeah, seven. And you know what? Even if it was seven, that's still seven times too much, right, to have to make a change. All right? So what we want to get, we want to get to our HTML code to have the same luxury that we have with our CSS code. That is, if we have a change to something that's in common, we only want to change it in one place. All right? And with plain old HTML, you really can't do that unless you imply some sort of server-side stuff. And depending on the technology, there's some different things that you can apply on the server to achieve this. Because remember, server-side code are recipes to make web pages. They're not actual completed web pages. So we can include in our recipe, hey, use this chunk of code from such and such place. And that is what a master page is. A master page is a place where we're going to put code that's common either to all of our pages or to a certain subset of pages. Okay? What do you want to do a website about today? Cheese. Cheese. We'll do a website about cheese, all right? 
We should do it. We should do a website for Grandpa's Cheese Barn. Uh, there we go. We'll do that. All right. Any any of you have been to Grandpa's Cheese Barn? No. Where's it at? It is in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> yeah. It is close to Ashland, Ohio. Um, it might not be actually in Ashland, but it is it is in that direction. Let, let's let's take a look. Right off the highway. Right off the highway. Yeah. Really? Yeah, they had pictures over there. You get sick. If you, if you have not seen it or been there, if you drive around a lot, you're going to see yeah. signs for it. Yeah. I, I've seen uh, I've, I've seen a, a joke that said what Ohio is. It's like. There's the lake, there's Cleveland, there's corn, then there's Grandpa's Cheese Barn, then there's more corn, there's Columbus, there's more corn, then there's the Ohio River, all right, or Cincinnati, depending on, on how you score it. Um, looks like they have a new store. Wow. That is one big hunk of cheese. All right. So let's say we're going to do a store, or, or we're going to do a website for Grandpa's Cheese Farm. All right? Let's sketch out what we're going to do. Because, again, it's always a good idea to have a plan before you go and do it. Right? Not that your plan is, is carved in stone. Right? Not that if you, when you're working on it, you come up with a better idea, or you realize that you forgot something, or whatever, you decide to deviate a little bit from that plan. However, it's best to have a plan. For example, the analogy I always give is like if I was going to drive to Columbus, I may plan on going this way, that way, get on 71 and take 71 all the way into Columbus. Well, if I were to happen to find that there was, um, you know, a uh, big construction on I-71, I might then go and take a detour and go on some other road to get there. That doesn't mean that it wasn't worth it to plan, right? It just means that I'm going to be smart enough to know when it's best to bail on my plan and take a different direction. All right? So it's always a good idea to make a plan. Now, I'm going to make this very basic, um, but you can use everything you know about CSS and HTML and all that to do a better job of this. So let's think of what we would want to have on our pages. Let's sketch out a wireframe. Those of you who had me for CISS 216, you understand what a wireframe is. So we're going to put this together and we're going to review a little bit about um, CSS in doing this. All right? So let's say I want my page to look like this. All right? I want a banner on the top of every single page. Grandpa's cheese barn. Maybe I have a picture in there. All right? Maybe not. We'll keep it simple for now. All right. Uh, maybe I have a description of exactly what that is. Because, frankly, if you saw Grandpa's Cheese Barn and there was no context given, you might wonder what it is. You know, what is Grandpa's Cheese Barn? Is it a restaurant? Is it a factory where Grandpa makes his cheese? Or, what, you know, whatever. All right? We're going to have a navigation on the left side. Remember, we're going to have this on every, every, every single page. All right. And I'm going to consider this to be a fairly small website. All right. So I'm just going to have a main navigation. I'm not going to worry about sub-navigations quite yet. All right. And what are my links going to be? I'm going to have a home page. I'm going to have a location page. I'm going to have a product page. And I'm going to have a contact us page. All right. I'm doing that because I don't want to really spend a lot of time
I make it a million pages. If we do four of them, you'll have the idea. All right? Then I'm going to have a footer. So that on every page, there's going to be maybe um, an email address, a phone number, and the address. Remember what these main sections are. You know, the banner of your page, you're, uh, you want to have so that it's very clear to anyone landing on that page what your site's about. All right? You have a navigation, obviously, to allow people to go to the different pages on your site. You want your navigation to stand out and to be very clear. And you want it to be consistent. Finally, your footer is where you put important information that people might want to access on any page. But stuff, I would say, is a secondary, uh, secondary level information. I mean, not everyone visiting Grandpa's Cheese Farm is going to want to send an email, right? But if you do want to send an email, it should be easy enough to find, all right? And yeah, we could put that on the Contact Us page, but it's sort of nice for it to be on every page, to be on the footer. So we're going to put it there. Now, what about this section here? What's going to appear in this section here? The different info of the different pages. Exactly. The stuff that is distinct to each given page. So, on our home page, we might have a picture and a paragraph describing what it is. On the location page, we might have a map or a link to Google Maps or the address or whatever. On our products page, we might have pictures and descriptions of the products that we sell. And finally, on our Contact Us site, we might have the phone number and the email and that sort of stuff. I'm going to outline this in green just to make it different. And I'm going to use a wavy line just to also make it different. What that means is that's going to be different on every page. All right? So this is the stuff that we, the stuff that is outlined in black is the stuff that we want to have common on every page. All right? That's the stuff that we want to create one place for it and put it there. Because if I decide to add another link to this, or I decide to change the verbiage here, or put a picture, or whatever, I don't want to have to do that on all the pages on my site. I only want to do that on one page. All right? So, we're going to create a master page that contains the common stuff. We will then clone that master page and create an individual ASPX page that only contains the stuff that's highlighted in the green. All right? So let's go and, and do that. website, C sharp. I'm going to browse. I'm going to put it on the desktop. And I'm going to call it GCB, Grandpa's Cheese Barn. And I click open. Doesn't exist. Do I want to create it? Yes, I am. Yes, I do. So now, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create my master page. 
and my master page again is going to have my common HTML code in it. And again, I would suggest creating this page the way that you would create any web page. Start with the HTML, get the structure right, create the CSS that applies to it, all right, and then you're good to go. Now, my master page can contain ASP.NET controls, all right. My initial example is not going to contain any ASP.NET controls. It's only going to contain plain old HTML code. But I could put ASP.NET controls in if I wanted to. So I'll go in and say new file. And I'm going to pick down here a master page. I'm not going to pick a web form. I'm going to pick a master page. And I can give it a name. And it has a .master extension to it. And what it's going to give me is it's going to give me the shell of an HTML page. All right. And just like my ASPX pages, it's going to give me the UI, the presentation part of it, and the code behind file. Because I can have code for this too. Now, let's look what's different. There are two ASP.NET controls on this page. And they're both called content placeholders. All right. What do you think those content placeholders represent? The content of what page? Your other pages. Content of what were you going to say? Oh, same thing. Yeah, the content of the other pages. This is where the stuff that's distinct to each page is going to appear. So I'm not going to put anything in here on my master page. This is the blank that's going to get filled in on every individual page. And you're given by default two of these. You're given one in the head, in case you need to put something in the head section. And you're given one for the body, because you're more likely going to need to put something in the body section. So these are the blank spaces. These are the things that in the diagram I drew up there, we're in green, or in the green wavy line. All right. Everything outside of that is going to be the common code, the code that is distinct from page to page to page. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start writing this code just like I was writing a regular HTML page. All right. What would that banner on the top, what tag should I use for that? Yeah, I, I, I heard a couple of things. I heard someone say header, and that's correct. I'm going to use a header tag. And again, I'm not going to go in a lot of detail with this. I am going to review basics of HTML, basics of CSS, but I'm not going to spend tons of time on this. What's the navigation going to be? And finally, what's the footer going to be? Footer. Could I make that one easier? All right. So in here, I might put an H1 that has the text Grandpa's Cheese Barn. And maybe a paragraph that says Central Ohio's Cheese um, Cheese um, Headquarters. I don't know. All right, my footer, I might put an email address contact. D. Huffman <laughs> at LorraineCCC.edu with any questions, with your cheese requests. Or you can say with your cheesy questions. Yeah, there you go. Okay. With your cheese requests. All right. 
Um, would it be great um, if, like, after I posted this video, like to hear Huffman at the next faculty meeting saying something like, I keep getting these emails from people around the world that want to know, like, how I can get, like, some brie or cannon, camembert or, or Swiss or whatever. I think that would be really cool. So if you're out there, shoot them an email. All right, that'll, that'll show how, how far this goes. All right. Nav, what do we want our navigation to be? We want our navigation typically to be an unordered list. Now, there actually are ASP.NET controls for navigation, but we're not going to talk about them now. All right. But just to review, it's an unordered list, and we're going to go and make What's our home page going to be called? Default. Default.aspx. That's a convention that you probably should follow. Oops. Doesn't look right. Yes, it is. All right, then we had what? We had products. They have two, so I'll put location. in design mode and see what it looks like. And no surprise, it's, it, it looks very, very bare bones. It looks beautiful. All right, it looks befitting some places awesome as Grandpa's Cheese Barn. All right. And I'm going to put a little bit of styling on this, so just, um, just to make it look a little better. All right. Um, let's see. How do I want to do this? I'm going to go and... Now, question. Can I run this and view this in the browser? Right. I can't run and view this in a, in a browser. A web server doesn't serve up master pages. The web server serves up ASPX pages that come from master pages. So if I try to go and view this, it's not going to let me. This is just like a part of a web page. It's not a web page. So I can't go and, and ask the server to deliver it. And it gives me an error like that. Even if I put in the name, which was what? Masterpage.master. It's still not going to. All right. Request filtering module is configured to deny this file extension. What that is saying is you can't directly ask for a master page. You have to ask for a page that is cloned from a master page. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put some simple CSS on it, and then we're going to clone it. All right. Actually, no. I'll go and do the CSS later. I'll go and do the CSS later. Um, right now, I'm going to clone it to make my default page. So we can view this in a browser. All right. So I'm going to say new file. Now I'm making a web form that's called default.aspx. And now we are going to use this checkbox that says select master page. Can you have more than one master page? No. That would defeat the purpose, wouldn't it? The answer is yes, you can. All right. Why would you want to have more than one master page? Pardon me? Um, possibly. 
If you're on a mobile device, you might want uh, different, yes. Just different areas of your website. Yeah, different sections of your site. Um, for example, like maybe like your main content pages look a certain way, but your photo galleries look a different way would be an example of that. The other thing that's, that's useful with this is we can nest master pages. That is, we can take this master page as a starting point and make a second master page that uses this as a starting point and adds in something distinct for another section or whatever. So you do have to select which master page that you use. In our case, that selection is going to be pretty easy because we only have one, right? So I'll click Add, and then I want to use that master page. And notice what I get. I do not get a complete web page. I get content controls. Now, what do those content, content controls correspond to? They correspond to the content placeholders here. So, anything I put in this content placeholder, or in this content control, is going to go in the content placeholder with the ID in the master page of content placeholder 1. So anything I put here is going to be put here because it uses the ID to match it up. So I can go here and I can put And then I could put some text in there. Grandpa's cheese barn was opened in 1793. I don't know when it was open. Whenever. All right. Now I can ask to see the default page. And that default page is going to be these two things sort of slapped together. It's going to take everything that is in these content areas and put them in the content placeholder in the master page. So, and where does it put it in? It matches up by the ID. So this stuff is going to go in that content placeholder. So now if I go and run this, it's going to work. It's going to give me default.aspx and as you notice, there's the stuff that was in there. So we notice that the stuff comes from two different places, right? Some of the HTML code comes from our master page. Some of the HTML code comes from our specific page. So we could do that for the other three pages. And I'm going to go and do that just, and I'm not going to put a lot of content in, in uh, on those pages, but I'm going to make those other pages just so that we have, when we leave here today, a rudimentary but fully completed, in some respects, site. Yes? Um, what would happen if, I mean, can you do like the follow up and have the pull from two master pages, or is it only be linked to one? Uh, a page can only be linked to a single master page. That master page, however, can be a master page, a nested master page, okay. where you have some of the stuff come from master page A and some of the stuff come from master page B. Uh, that's a little more complicated. We probably won't go over that today, but we'll probably go over that on Tuesday. And why would you do that? That would be a case where you have sections of your site that have the same look. All right? You have a common look for every page on the site, like we saw Amazon did and whatever, and then we have a section that is only there for certain kinds of pages, certain subsets of pages. All right, so let's go and let's create the other pages. So let's click Add. Oops, Add. File. Web form. Products. Select master page.
and I'm just going to put the word products here. New file web form. Locations. Select the master page. And finally, our Contact Us page. So now when I run this, I have my home page. Oh, there's my contact us page. I can go my home page, my products page, my locations page, my contacts us page. And everything is is uh, consistent. Now, the advantage of this of course comes in when you want to go and make a change to something on the master page. So, for example, let's say I want to put in, change the title to say, World Famous Grandpa's Cheese Barn. I can just put that change in here and because all those pages are cloned from this master page, every one of those pages gets the change. So the home page gets it, the product gets it, the locations get it, and the contact us gets it. Now, for your CISS 216 project, um, those of you that had CISS 216 uh, with me, probably what you did is you made a template, you made an HTML template, and then just copied it. All right, which is okay, uh, provided you never wanted to go back and change the template. Because after you clone the template, after you copy those files over, if you made a change to the common content, you'd have to go and change each individual HTML file. Whereas here, because we've abstracted and put that code in its own file, all we have to do is change that one single file, and we're ready, good to go. All right. Now, we can put CSS associated with our master file as well, all right? And um, the advantage again is, is because that master file is used on all of our files, whatever CSS we put in there is going to apply to all of our pages. So let's just put in some rudimentary CSS just to sort of make this look uh, a little more like a completed website. All right. So I'm going to go in. I'm going to say file, new, file, style sheet. And I'm going to say header with 100%, float left, border, 2 pixel, black solid, Nav with thirty percent minimum width two hundred pixels border. 
two pixel My aim here isn't to teach CSS, but just to show how you can link all these pieces together and how our final web page is going to be pulling stuff from a lot of different places. I'm just going to keep the color scheme very simple. Ideally, you would use cheesier colors for this to go along with the theme. Now, Remember I said we need a hook in our, in our ASP.NET code to apply CSS. So for example, I want to write style on this guy, on this content placeholder, which corresponds to this code here. How could I write style that applied to the stuff that's in that content placeholder? Pardon me? By ID. By ID would be a very straightforward way. What other options could I use? I could assign a class to it and then write in where do I assign the class to it? Just kidding, I can't assign a class to it. I could also put, wrap a section tag around it if I wanted to. And in fact, that's what I'm going to do. And I'm going to give that section a class. And I'm going to call it content area. Now, the ID wasn't wrong. All right. But I'm just illustrating that you could do it a couple different ways. In fact, let's, yeah, let's go and do it with the ID. I like that idea better. You could also do it other ways. Um, so I'm going to go and say pound sign, content placeholder, with forty percent float left, float left. and I have to apply that to the master page. I don't have to apply that to each individual page because, again, each individual page is going to get cloned from this master's master page. 
So I'll go in and I'll say link rel equals style sheet. Type equals text CSS. href equals, and I'll put the name of my style sheet in here. Should go in and give a title to this. Now when I run this, Actually, I could go and view <laughs> in design mode. That's what it looks like. Again, we're moving in the direction of being better styled. Um, I can look at the default page in design mode. Interesting, which I have to save everything. There we go. Now notice a couple of things. This is gray and I get the little thing saying no, no. All right, even when I'm in design mode. Why do I get that? Why do I get this little thing saying, nope, you can't change something here? Oops. Yet when I put my cursor here, I can change stuff there. It's not here. That's your master? Yeah. You're locked out of the parts that come from the master, master page. So I can, on my clone pages, I can only change the areas that are inside the content areas. All right? I can't go and change anything. If I want to change something on the master page, I have to go and change it on the master page itself. All right. Just think about it as a good thing. I mean, it, you know, you don't want to, you know, you, you, you want to be aware when you change it that um, you're changing the master page and not just changing an individual page. So it locks you out of that. So now when we go and run it, we get our page to look like this. Yeah, I say lovely, win all sorts of design awards. The main lesson here is how these things connect together. All right, how these things connect to form a unit. And again, you can use any CSS trick that you learned in CISS 216 or otherwise um, to sort of finish it up. All right. Questions about this? Should make the background yellow or some appropriately cheesy color. Or white with flecks of mold uh, in it. <laughs> or have a giant picture of cheese. Giant picture of cheese. A giant wheel of cheese. Yeah, your must I wish my car had cheese. Pardon me? Your must be a slice of cheese. Yeah, the, 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 yeah exactly. The, the, <laughs> the, the, the mouse cursor could be a slice of cheese. All right. So that, in a nutshell, is how master pages work. All right? We still have a little bit more to talk about this on this subject, because really the bigger subject here is uh, what ASP.NET uh, controls do for UI, all right, to make your UI life easier. What we're going to go over on Tuesday is we're going to talk about nesting master, master pages. All right, so that you can put a master page inside a master page and then clone from that. And again, that would be the case where you had sections of your site that looked one way, sections of your site that looked another way. All right. Um, we are going to talk about navigation controls. All right. Because this unordered list gets the job done. But like if you have something that looks like this.
where you have a main navigation on the top, and as you mouse over, you get a sub-navigation. That's something that many, many, many sites have. All right? Many sites have it because it's a nice way to allow you to, with a relatively small amount of space on the main page, have an awful lot of links. I mean, could you imagine if all these links showed all the time? All right, the page would be nothing but navigation. Whereas with this, you can choose what you get to see at any given point in time. There are controls in the ASP.NET framework that allow you to do something like this relatively easy. So we'll look at those navigation controls. The other thing that we will look at is, is a sitemap control. And the sitemap control makes it easy um, to define things such as breadcrumbs. What are breadcrumbs on a website? Yeah, the page that you came from. Exactly. So, this doesn't really have breadcrumbs. All right. Let's see if LC site has them. These are breadcrumbs. They show you the path of how you got there. From the home, you went into academic programs, and then you went to associate degrees and certificates, certificate programs. That's a useful navigation uh, tool, because it allows you to sort of back up and do that. With the sitemap, you can automatically generate your navigation controls, and you can automatically generate these breadcrumbs, which are a useful navigation item. So those will be the things that we will explore next time. Nested master pages, navigation controls, sitemaps, and breadcrumbs. All right, any questions? All right, we will see you up in lab. <laughs>